Good afternoon, everybody. So as the president spoke to yesterday, uh, the United States underco undertook a counterterrorism operation in Kabul, Afghanistan on Saturday. At his direction, the U.S. intelligence targeted and killed Ayman al-Zawahiri, al-Qaeda's leader. We know you have questions about this today, and so we wanted to make sure that um, we had uh, John Kirby come back. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the specifics of that operation and the extension also of truce in Yemen, which is incredibly important, and uh, any other foreign policy news of the day. With that, I give you John Kirby, uh, National, National Security Council uh, Coordinator for Strategic Communications. Thanks. Thanks. Great. There we go. Appreciate it. That's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, as Karine noted, then uh, you all have obviously been tracking uh, the president's announcement yesterday that on the 30th of July, the United States undertook a precision counterterrorism operation in Kabul. They targeted and killed Al Qaeda's leader Ayman Al Zawahiri. Zawahiri was the world's most wanted terrorist. He was Osama bin Laden's deputy during the 9/11 attacks and became his successor in 2011, following bin Laden's death during a U.S. counterterrorism mission. Zawahiri continued to pose an active threat to U.S. persons, interests, and national security. As President Biden has consistently said, we will not allow Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists who might bring harm to Americans, to the homeland. We met that commitment. This action demonstrates that without American forces on the ground in Afghanistan and in harm's way, we still remain able to identify and locate even the world's most wanted terrorist and then take the action to remove him from the battlefield. That is the definition, this mission, of when we talked a year ago of over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability. What we did this past weekend is a perfect, a clean example of what that capability looks like. Now on to uh, Taiwan. As you have all seen, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, arrived in Taiwan uh, earlier this morning, East Coast time. Uh, as we have said, the Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan. And a Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before without incident, as have many members of Congress over the years, including this year. Now, this trip was the Speaker's decision, and Congress is an independent branch of government. You all know that. We're obviously monitoring her travel, as we always do for members of Congress, and we've taken all appropriate measures to ensure the safety of her travel throughout the region. Let me be clear. The Speaker's visit is totally consistent with our longstanding One China policy. We've been very clear that nothing has changed about our One China policy, which is guided, of course, by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint U.S. PRC communiques, and the six assurances. We've said that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We've said we do not support Taiwan independence. And we've said, as I said again yesterday, that we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. And we have communicated this directly to the PRC at the highest levels, including in last week's call between President Biden and President Xi. The National Security Advisor, the Secretaries of State and Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff have also made this very clear to Beijing in a half a dozen recent high-level conversations. Now, we've seen a number of announcements from the PRC in just the last several hours that are, unfortunately, right in line with what we had anticipated and what we talked about yesterday. Now, there's no reason, as I said yesterday, for Beijing to turn this visit, uh, uh, which is consistent with longstanding U.S. policy, into some sort of crisis, or use it as a pretext to increase aggressiveness uh, and, and military activity in or around the Taiwan Strait, now or beyond her travel. And again, as I made clear yesterday, before the Speaker's travel was confirmed by her, China has positioned itself to take further steps. And we expect that they will continue to react over a longer-term horizon. I couldn't give you a date certain of what that horizon looks like, but we certainly would expect them to react even beyond her trip, including announcing additional uh, uh, large-scale live, live fire exercises. Of course, they've already started doing some of that today, flying across the median line, seen press reports of them doing that today and using economic coercion. It's exactly in line with the playbook that we anticipated and talked to you about yesterday. The United States will not and does not, will not seek and does not want a crisis. We are prepared to manage 
what Beijing chooses to do. At the same time, we will not engage in saber rattling. We will continue to operate in the seas and the skies of the Western Pacific as we have done for decades. We will continue to support Taiwan, defend a free and open Indo-Pacific, and seek to maintain communication with Beijing. We will keep doing what we are doing, which is supporting cross-strait peace and stability. And then just real quick, lastly, uh, uh, Crean uh, uh, hinted to this at the top. Uh, the President welcomes today's announcement of an extension of the truce in the Yemen conflict. The truce in Yemen, of course, was a key agenda item during the President's visit to Saudi Arabia, where he met with the King and the Crown Prince and with leaders from across the region. We're grateful for the leadership of Saudi Arabia throughout this truce process, as well as the Sultan, as well as for the Sultan and leaders uh, of Oman, who have also played an important role throughout. Now, this truce is now going on five months, has brought a period of unprecedented calm in Yemen, saving thousands of lives and bringing tangible relief for countless Yemenis. Five months, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're talking about seven years of war and thousands and thousands of Yemeni lives, it counts for a lot. And now we have a chance to extend this another two months. So we urge the Yemeni parties to seize this opportunity to work constructively under UN auspices to reach an inclusive, comprehensive agreement that paves the way for a durable, Yemeni-led resolution to the conflict. Advancing the peace process is going to require courage and dedication from all sides. The United States will remain committed and engage in efforts to advance peace in Yemen and to bring relief to the Yemeni people. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, how concerned is the administration right now that the Afghanistan has become a safe haven for terrorists? I think if you were to ask some members of al-Qaeda, ask them how, how safe they feel in Afghanistan right now. Um, I think we proved uh, to a fair thee well this weekend that it isn't a safe haven and it isn't going to be going forward. What will the repercussions be for uh, the Taliban harboring al -Zawakri? I'm not going to telegraph uh, moves and decisions that we might make. I'm certainly not going to get ahead of anything at this point. Uh, I would just make uh, two points. One, uh, the strike itself shows how serious we are uh, about accountability, it shows how serious we are about defending our interests. and. We're going to maintain, as I said at the outset, we're going to maintain this over-the-horizon capability. In fact, I'd go so far as to say we're going to continue to try to improve that capability going forward. Um, and number two, we've communicated very directly with Taliban leaders um, uh, our views of, of uh, their willingness at, at some level, of course, to, to harbor uh, Zawahiri and, uh, and his family. Um, and we have made it clear that not we believe, not we think, not we suppose, but we know that that's a violation of the Doha Agreement. So obviously, John, just to follow up on that, clearly this shows accountability for Zawahiri and for al-Qaeda, wherever they are, as yeah. you got them in Afghanistan. But it doesn't show accountability for what the Secretary of State described as a gross violation of the Doha Agreement. So can you commit that there will be some act to demonstrate that they will be held accountable in some way? And how do you do that without it looking like, yep, we'll just take out one by one, you can keep allowing more in? Well, again, I'm not going to telegraph punches that haven't been thrown yet um, or decisions that haven't been made yet. Um, we're going to stay vigilant to the threat. We've made it clear to the Taliban uh, that, uh, that we know what, what they did, and uh, we know who they harbored, uh, and we know some of the steps they tried to take after the strike to, to cover up the evidence of it. Um, so we're mindful of it. Um, but I'm not going to get ahead of decisions, policy decisions that haven't been made. I mean, the, it's not that we take the Taliban at their word, but just indulge me for a second. They claim they want a relationship with the United States and with the West. They claim they want to open up um, and be part of the international community. They, they claim they want financing. That's exactly right, Peter. Um, so if that's true, if that's what they really want, uh, then it would behoove them to, to pay close attention to what we just did over the weekend um, and to meet their agreements under the Doha Agreement. Without identifying them, how many other Al Qaeda individuals or leaders do you assess are presently living in Afghanistan? I'm not going to get into intelligence matters, uh, Peter. We we said even before we left Afghanistan last August that we knew Al Qaeda was uh, was present in Afghanistan in relatively small numbers, uh, and we know that there are still some Al Qaeda fighters in, in Afghanistan. I would uh, again, without getting into 
uh, classified information here, I would say the number's not very large. And that's, al and that's core al-Qaeda. There are also offshoots like ISIS-K, which we know are very active in Afghanistan and, um, uh, right now. The, the other thing that I want to say, and I, I know rightly we're focused on Afghanistan, but again, I want to take you back in time a little bit to about a year ago when we talked about this threat uh, and then our departure from Afghanistan. We know that al-Qaeda has metastasized both in terms of character. Now they've got different offshoot groups, al-Shabaab, ISIS, and ISIS has got splinter groups of its own. But they've also metastasized geographically. They're not focused as much in a presence in Afghanistan. They're in North Africa. They're in this, the Sahel. They're throughout the Middle East. In, they're in Yemen. Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, there are other uh, counterterrorism threats in other parts of the world. We're going to stay focused on them all. I get, I get that we're focused on Afghanistan right now, but we're not taking our eye off the rest of the world either. John, something you just said is not consistent with what we were told last year. You're saying that you've always known there was a small number of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. President Biden said, what interest do we have in Afghanistan at this point with al-Qaeda gone? Yeah, I mean, in a major way, al-Qaeda was not playing a, no, wait, let me, let me finish. They weren't playing a major role uh, in, in operations uh, or resourcing or planning in Afghanistan. But Peter, I, I know specifically, because I was at a different podium a year ago, and we talked about the fact that al-Qaeda had a presence in Afghanistan, but small and not incredibly powerful or, or, uh, or potent. And I think, again, without getting into numbers, we would still assess that to, to be the case. So we know that the Taliban was harboring the world's most wanted terrorist. You guys gave a whole country to a bunch of people that are on the FBI most wanted list. What did you think was going to happen? I would take issue with the premise that we gave a whole country to terrorist groups. I mean, again, I'd, 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 I'd encourage you to ask. The world's number one terrorist. How is that not giving a country to a, a terrorist sympathizing group, uh, if not giving them permission to have terrorists just well, sit on a balcony? The, the question, I mean, Peter, the way you asked that, it makes it sound like we owned Afghanistan a year ago. It wasn't our country. Um, it was an independent, sovereign state. And the president made a bold decision to end a war that had been going on for 20 years because he believed then and still believes now that our national security interests are best met by meeting the threats of today, not the threats of 2001. And uh, uh, we've, you know, I don't want to relitigate the whole war here, but uh, obviously no one anticipated the Ghani government to fall as fast as it did. Um, but we said at the time that as we depart Afghanistan, we're going to keep vigilant. We're going to stay ready, and we're not going to let Afghanistan become a safe haven for terrorists who threaten our homeland. And this past weekend, we proved that case precisely. But, so now that you know that the Taliban is not living up to the part of the deal that they made with the U.S. to not let Afghanistan be a place that terrorists feel like they can be safe, what are you going to do about it? Well, that gets to Peter's question. I'm not going to telegraph uh, decisions that haven't been made or, 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 or policy, uh, policy initiatives one way or the other. Are we I would just say for some spectacular terrorist attack in the U.S. to then say, oh, well, there's terrorists if we were, in, Peter, in Afghanistan, if we, now we can go get them? If we were, Peter, then we wouldn't have taken the hit on Saturday, the strike that we took on Mr. Zawahiri, if we were just waiting. This isn't about waiting. It's about watching. Um, and we watched very closely, and we acted on what we learned. And I would go so far as to say not only the American people are safer as a result of President Biden's decision, but the rest of the world is safer. Does that mean that the threat from al-Qaeda is over? No, of course it's not. Now, they'll have to make some decisions here, and we'll watch that too. Uh, and if we discern a, a threat to the American homeland again from them or any other terrorist group, the President will reserve the right to take that action again. We're going to go around. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, now that uh, House Speaker is actually in Taiwan, can you give us a sense of President Biden's uh, thoughts on the matter? Does he support that? Um, and then secondly, what kind of lines of communication, if any, are, are, are ongoing uh, today between the two governments? Uh, well, I mean, you have the Speaker of the House that's in Taipei uh, right now. Uh, of course, she's going to be meeting with government leaders. We have uh, stayed in touch with uh, our Taiwan counterparts, uh, of course, um, and uh, and we've stayed in touch with Speaker Pelosi's staff as she has progressed through this uh, trip. Just to clarify, I meant with Beijing. Uh, I don't have any specific 
good conversations with uh, with the PRC leaders uh, to speak to today. Uh, but we, as you know, we have an ambassador there. We have an embassy. I mean, we are in routine uh, communication with uh, with leaders in Beijing. But I refer you to the State Department for anything that they might or might not have uh, communicated. And then about President Biden, is he? Oh, look, I, I've said I said this yesterday. The the, the president, as a former senator, uh, fully respects uh, the right and the prerogative, frankly, the responsibility of members of Congress to include the Speaker of the House to travel overseas. That's a different question, or that's a different response. And does he support her going? He respects the speaker's decision to travel to Taiwan. Yeah, Courtney, in the back. Thank. Um, I wanted to ask about Ukraine, specifically the refugee situation. Uh, the president had committed to accepting 100,000 refugees from Ukraine, and I know that whole idea is that they would stay here temporarily for two years. Um, is the expectation that? Um, or is that still the U.S. view that they should be here for two years, or would you or the, or would the president consider extending that, given that the war is ongoing and you don't know when people may or may not be able to return home? I, I don't. I don't have any policy changes to speak to today. So, uh, I mean, I can happily take that question or refer you to the State Department. But I, I don't know of any changes to the, uh, the essential decision by the president to provide uh, a, a place for Ukrainian refugees uh, to come, even if it is just temporarily. I mean, what we've seen over the course of, uh, of now almost six months of war is that a lot of Ukrainians who left in the early weeks are going back uh, for various reasons. Um, and in the early weeks of the war, uh, we were seeing uh, families cross the border, and then uh, either the, the the mom or the dad or or both would drop the kids off with somebody and go right back in. So there's a strong desire by Ukrainians to be in their homeland, to be in their country, and we respect that. Would you have you. to ask Congress for the ability for them to stay longer? I, I'm not going to. I won't get ahead of policy decisions that haven't been made yet. I mean, our commitment to supporting Ukraine has not changed. There's been no change to the president's uh, commitment in this regard in terms of welcoming refugees. But I just don't have any changes for you today. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Kirby, Anza already killed, he killed more than 200 people in Tanzania and in Kenya in 1998. And right now, even though the U.S. compensated U.S. citizens who were victims of those bombings, the people in Kenya and Tanzania, they've received nothing. What message do you have for them now same, that you've killed everything? Yeah, I'd say the same thing I told Mr. Ducey here, that uh, that this is not just a good day for the United States of America. It's a good day for the world. Yeah, but I'm saying that the families of the victims of those bombings were not compensated by the U.S. What message do you have for I, them? I don't have any compensation policies here to, to speak to. Again, M Mr. Zawahiri's death is is good for everybody around the world. Um, he was a killer, um, and uh, and it's uh, it's a good thing that he's no longer walking the face of the earth. It also means that we're going to have to stay vigilant to this threat going so forward. You that the lives of Kenya and Tanzania don't really matter. Wow, I got to take issue with that. I did not say that, and I don't even know where you came from on that one. Of course, all lives matter. You're upset, didn't I didn't you? say that. Yeah, I didn't right say. Right I, I didn't say that, sir. And I really, really take exception um, to the to the the tone and the implication in that question. Of course, their lives matter. Every life matters, particularly a life taken so violently uh, as by the hands of a terrorist. If those lives didn't matter, sir. We wouldn't have taken the action that we took this weekend. And if those lives didn't matter, sir, we wouldn't be staying vigilant to the threat going forward, which we will do. John, on Taiwan. Better answer. Um, Two answers. Both the dances. Nancy squared. Second row, Nancy. Was anything you saw today from China's response a surprise? I know that there were the drills and missile tests that Beijing announced that they would conduct. Was that what they've been warning about um, in private to the White House? I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, private discussions. Uh, uh, what I would tell you is that what we've seen thus far, and she just arrived, uh, is consistent with the playbook that we expected them to, uh, to run. And we'll just keep watching it. It's one of the reasons why I came out here yesterday to sort of lay some of that out for you. So what we've seen so far has been pretty consistent. And is the president planning to speak with Speaker Pelosi after she leaves Taiwan or when she gets back here to get a readout or a sense of that trip? I don't have any conversations that I'm that I'm that I could announce or speak to. Um, obviously, if he does have a conversation like that, I'm sure Kareem would would, would let you know. 
Thanks, Susie. Um, uh, when it comes to Taiwan, it appears the retaliation has already begun. China banned exports from 100 Taiwanese brands. Are you concerned that Taiwan is going to end up paying too steep a price for this U.S. visit? There's no reason for that to happen, Nancy. Um, as we said uh, today and yesterday, no reason for China to take what is a, a perfectly legitimate and consistent uh, travel by uh, the Speaker of the House and turn it into some pretext for amping up the tensions uh, or creating some sort of crisis or conflict. There's just simply no reason for that. And because we're, she's not acting, we're not acting in any way inconsistent with the way we've been acting now for decades since the Taiwan Relations Act was, uh, was passed into law back in the late 70s. Um, I, I can't speak for Chinese actions or Chinese decisions one way or another. We're going to continue to watch this and monitor this. Um, I, I would just say that uh, um, we don't support Taiwan independence. We've said that before. We do support Taiwan's self-defense in keeping with the Taiwan Relations Act. We're going to keep doing that, um, and we're going to keep um, working on revitalizing our alliances and partnerships in the region for uh, a free and, uh, and open Indo-Pacific. And what is this going to do to the U.S.-China relationship, which is already so fraught? I think the fact that the President talked to President Xi last week for two hours is an indication of um, how much the President uh, understands and respects the consequential nature of this bilateral relationship. Uh, as I've said before, one of the most consequential, not just in the region, but in the world. And the President wants to keep those lines of communication open. It is particularly important to do that when there's times of tension, like right now, to make sure those lines of communication remain open. So I would say, to answer your question, one, we don't want to see this spiral into any kind of a crisis or conflict. Again, we would say there's no reason to. And number two, we want to be able to maintain those lines of communication. But a lot of this is going to depend. What to an, the answering your question uh, is going to depend a lot on how China behaves uh, over coming days and weeks. Hey, John, John, come back. We'll come to the back. Uh, John, given the, uh, the concerns you were just talking about uh, in, uh, with, with China's actions in response to this visit by the speaker, um, the high intentions, the risks of provocations and the like. Does the president believe that the speaker's trip is a net benefit to U.S. national security interests or not? Uh, look, we, the president doesn't typically comment on congressional travel. Um, as I said, he respects her decision to go. Um, and he believes it's perfectly consistent with American policy going back decades and supported by both parties. But he, he doesn't, does he believe it hurts U.S. foreign policy interests in the region? The, the president um, has already seen that Speaker Pelosi has already accomplished um, some important conversations uh, on this trip with respect to foreign policy, with her stop in Singapore and uh, Kuala Lumpur. Um, um, and then you know she's uh, already announced she's moving on to Japan and South Korea, two of our treaty allies in the Pacific. So um, uh, he welcomes her uh, conversations. She, he, he welcomes her um, uh, contributions to uh, American foreign policy and our foreign policy objectives uh, overseas. But, I mean, the trip's not, not even over yet. So I think we, we ought to give the speaker a chance to, to talk about what she did, what she learned, um, and what she took away from this trip when she gets back. And then just back to the uh, Zawahi strike, um, does, uh, you mentioned that the, you worked at the Telegraph the punches before they were thrown, but has the president decided that the Taliban should pay a price, or has he not decided that they should pay a price for harboring al-Qaeda? I'm not going to get ahead of the president on this. I think the Taliban already uh, has paid a price just in terms of um, the now very public acknowledgment that they were harboring Zawahiri and his family. Um, and that the United States did exactly what the president promised we would do. Now, beyond that, I'm just not going to get ahead of uh, the president or any decisions he might or might not make. The Taliban have a choice now. Well, they always did, but they certainly have a new choice, uh, and that is they can comply with their agreement uh, under the Doha uh, agreement, uh, comply with their commitments under the Doha agreement, or they can choose to keep going down a different path. And if they go down a different path, it's going to lead to consequences, not just from the United States, but from the international community. Um, this is a 
this is a group that says they, they want to govern, um, that they want legitimacy, that they want financing, that they want international support. Um, and if that's true, then one would hope that they would behave uh, in a manner consistent with those goals. Harboring Mr. Zawahiri and his family um, and being willing to, um, uh, to allow them to live in downtown Kabul and then, uh, and then to try to cover up the fact that they were seems inconsistent with those goals. Hey, Jeremy, then we're going back to you. Um, I have a question on Taiwan, but first on Zawahiri. Um, was Siraj Haqqani aware that Zawahiri was in Kabul? There were senior members of the Haqqani network that were uh, aware. I'm not going to go any further than that. Okay, so you won't say if Siraj Haqqani himself was, was aware? I'm not going to go any further. Okay. Um, you, you felt up these strikes, this strike as a, a vindication of the U.S.'s over the horizon. Um, capabilities, but what makes you confident that you can maintain that capability and that this wasn't simply a one-off? I mean, to my knowledge, this is the first and only counterterrorism strike the U.S. has conducted since the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It's the first and only over the rise counterterrorism strike we conducted in Afghanistan. That's what I'm sorry. Since then. But you remember we also killed Haji Abdullah uh, in Syria yeah, using an over the horizon capability. So what gives me confidence is um, the, coming from a place of understanding my, myself from previous assignments, um, what our capabilities are in the region. Um, and they're robust. And we said that at the time. We've heard Secretary Austin say there's not a scrap of the earth that the United States can't touch if we, if we need to. And that's true. And since last year, Jeremy, we have worked hard to try to improve those capabilities. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of how we're doing that right now, but we have. Uh, we've worked hard to make them more robust, and the process of improvement doesn't have a it doesn't have a shelf life. There's no deadline on that. You constantly try to improve military capabilities, and particularly one uh, in this realm. Uh, so well, I mean, we can expect Al Qaeda is probably going to behave a little differently now. So we're going to have to be mindful of that. So we're always going to be working to to get better at it. And are but, you- are you going to limit those efforts to targeting only the highest of value targets in Afghanistan? The president, I think, laid it out very clearly um, back then and then, uh, and then yesterday, that we're going to make sure that Afghanistan cannot become a safe haven for terrorists who want to attack or, or are plotting to attack uh, the United States of America and our interests. And then very quickly on Taiwan, um, what, what is the U.S. doing to prepare for any further Chinese action and particularly any military repercussions for Taiwan yeah. uh, from China? Are, are we seeing any force posture changes in the region um, and anything else that the U.S. is doing to help Taiwan? I think you can itself? understand I'm not going to talk about force posture or military movements one way or the other. Um, we're, we're, a different podium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice try. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, we uh, we take our secu- security commitments uh, in the region broadly very, very seriously. We have robust military capability, uh, obviously, available um, uh, to meet those commitments. We're going to watch what happens here as closely as we can. The only thing that I will say, uh, as I said at the, 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 the top, is that we're going to make sure that Speaker Pelosi's trip, the whole trip, is, is safe and secure for her. Thank you. Um, as you mentioned, we're seeing some pretty provocative stuff, unfortunately, from China, whether that's canceling food exports or planned military exercises. Um, I'm wondering, given these developments, does the White House believe that it would have been better that news of Speaker Pelosi's proposed trip had not leaked last month? Would it have been better if this remained secret until she was on the ground? Uh, look, it's hard to speak to leaks. Uh, in, in this town and what effect they, I mean, you're asking me to sort of go back in time and, um, and you know, sort of disprove a negative here. I, uh, look, we, uh, uh, the leak was certainly unfortunate. Uh, wherever it came from, it was unfortunate uh, because the speaker, as we have said, Corrine has said, and I have said, should be able to talk to her travel in her own terms. Um, and, uh, and, you know, she, when she, she landed, she, she announced she was there. One more very quickly. Um, House Republicans are already moving forward with legislation that they plan on proposing it um, that would create a sort of lend-lease program for Taiwan. Is this an overreaction? Is this something that perhaps heightens tensions at a moment when they should be mellowed? I won't speak to Congress and their motivations or whoever, uh, and I'm certainly not going to talk about proposed legislation. Uh, I would tell you that 
it's time to wake up. Um, I would tell you that um, there's been long-standing bipartisan support since the late 70s for the Taiwan Relations Act, both, both sides of the aisle. And that remains today. Uh, and we take our obligations under that act very seriously, which provides for a, a way, a, a method uh, of assisting uh, Taiwan with their self-defense. And so through the, I can't, you know, I can't speculate about where this proposed legislation is going to go, and I'm certainly not going to uh, offer an a administration policy statement on it since it's simply proposed, uh, but I can be certain, and it's important for everybody to understand how seriously we take our obligations under that Taiwan Relations Act, and we're going to continue to do that. I mean, even just under, uh, uh, under President Biden, you know, we've uh, we provided a billion dollars worth of uh, defense articles uh, under the Taiwan Relations Act. So it's it's a serious commitment. Thanks, sir. Sebastian. Thank you, Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Sebastian. Yeah. Um, so two questions, please. Um, can you confirm Chinese media reports that the U.S. ambassador in Beijing was summoned by the government and it was in the middle of the night? That's the Global Times is reporting on it. We, we know that uh, Ambassador Burns has had discussions with his Chinese interlocutors, um, but I'd refer you to the State Department in terms of being summoned in the middle of the night. Okay. And the other one, uh, there was a um, there was an interesting uh, nugget in the middle of a latest Thomas Friedman column, um, which was ostensibly all about Taiwan, but he meant, then mentions Ukraine. And there was an intriguing couple of paragraphs in there where he's supposedly quoting people from inside the administration telling him that, I can't remember the exact words, but it was essentially that there's, there's more less trust in Volodymyr Zelensky than is being reported and that there's, uh, uh, actually I've got it right here, there is deep mistrust between the White House and President Volodymyr Zelensky. I'm only asking you because Thomas Friedman is obviously a, somebody who's read widely and supposedly has, you know, contact with people inside the White House. So. Yeah, the President has spoken many, many <coughs> times to his admiration for President Zelensky's leadership and courage in this time of war. He has obviously spoken to President Zelensky personally many times, and, um, and he knows, uh, the, understands the, the, the stress that President Zelensky and all the Ukrainian people are under, and that's why he has remained very committed to continuing to support Ukraine uh, in their fight against Russian aggression. Um, he has uh, privately and publicly uh, expressed that respect uh, for President Zelensky and for the challenges that he and his, uh, and his fellow citizens are facing. In an effort to advance the public's understanding of, of what happened in the, in the Azamaria operation, uh, can you explain that the, the Hellfire missiles apparently have these blades? Can, can you explain how operationally that worked and to avoid civilian casualties, what the capabilities of those missiles are and how it all played out? No. Uh, uh, all right. How about this one? Uh, last night, um, a senior official was asked, uh, you know, to, to avoid any doubt being aired about uh, whether, in fact, it was Awarni who was targeted. Uh, there's multiple intelligence sources, multiple methods. Is there anything you can tell us to avoid any doubt being aired about the fact that it was, in fact, Zawari who was killed? There's a limit to how much detail we can provide on this. Um, I would tell you that. It's a combination of visual evidence um, and evidence collected through other means um, that led us to the certainty before that this was the guy and that led us to the conclusion after with a high degree of confidence that he was no more. It's it's a visual evidence and a, and a, and a, and and evidence collected through through other means. I, I really think that's about as far as I can go. But the assessment is high confidence um, that uh, that we got who we were aiming for. And I think you know just without getting into more detail, I mean just the the, the various things that. Uh, the people on the ground did afterward also um, uh, helped us come to that conclusion. 
Um, last year, the Biden administration was undertaking a review of its drone policy. Um, I can't find any evidence that that review is completed or released to the public. And um, I'm wondering what the status of that is, but also what this, um, what this operation tells us about President Biden's approach to the use of drones. Uh, in in poor policy. Now, I don't have an update on the policy review. Uh, we can take that and see if we can get back to you on something. I just don't I don't have an update for you on that uh, today. But I think in every thing that you've seen President Biden do as commander in chief, and now I can speak with some authority on that, having served in another building, um, uh, it's uh, there is a respect for the use of force. Um, and an appreciation for both the, the power that's resident in the use of force as well as the limits of some of that power around the world that the president fully, fully respects. Um, and, uh, and he has a deep appreciation for if the military tool is going to be used, that it's used to pursue a very discreet national security interest and that the tools used are appropriate to the task um, and unmanned aerial vehicles are a tool a very powerful tool you can't use them for everything you shouldn't use them for everything uh, but in a case like this um, well I think the results speak for themselves uh, thank you uh, if you could talk a little bit about why the president uh, in the case of Zawari ordered a CIA drone strike and not a military strike and Specifically, if, um, if Pakistan was notified ahead of time uh, in this case. Uh, there were no notifications in advance. Given the, given the collection of information that we had over the previous six, seven months, the location of the target, uh, the geography, um, and the president's strong desire, strong desire to avoid civilian casualties, uh, it was his decision that the best way to, to execute this strike uh, was to do it with unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, you might remember uh, months ago when we launched a, another over the horizon counterterrorism strike in, in Syria against um, Haji Abdullah, uh, that there was a, a blend. There was a, a use of, uh, of, of uh, actual American forces as well as uh, unmanned, aerial, unmanned aerial vehicles uh, in support. So every case is different. Every mission is different. And back to the previous question, as commander in chief, the, the president takes a very discerning view about the use of military or, or any kind of what we call kinetic power and how that's, how that's applied. Um, I'm not going to, again, speak to the uh, units here or what, what personnel were involved in this, but this was done uh, only with, uh, with UAVs. And again, it was a result of a very careful, thoughtful, deliberate, I would say almost painstaking uh, uh, decision-making process led by the president and his national security team to make sure that the the target was valid and that the tools to go after that target were the best ones. And again, I say the results speak for themselves. Zawari's gone, and nobody in his family got hurt. So, so then, then you're saying this had nothing to do with sort of having any kind of plausible deniability if the mission were to not succeed? I mean, was that even part of the calculation here? No. Question on on the speaker's uh, trip to Taiwan. I mean, I know you're saying everything China has done was largely sort of anticipated, but uh, from all the reactions you have seen so far, are there any that have caused you know are, are cause of concern for this administration? Uh, look, I think just broadly speaking, um, the, the it's concerning to see them react uh, in the way they've reacted. Um, there's no need for that. There's no there's no justification. Uh, to turn this into a crisis. So it's unfortunate uh, uh, that they have already chosen to act in ways we kind of predicted that they would. Um, we would again remind uh, uh, leaders 
uh, in Beijing that there's nothing unprecedented about this trip. I, I heard a Chinese spokesman uh, earlier today was saying that it violates their sovereignty. There's no violation of sovereignty. The uh, speaker going is perfectly consistent with other members of Congress going, as I said, including this year. So there's just no reason to amp this up. And we're not going to participate in that. As I said at the outset, we're not going to do saber rattling. We're simply going to do what we have to do to make sure that her trip is safe and secure um, and that we can meet our security commitments uh, in, in, the, in the region uh, writ broadly and also to make sure that we can keep those lines of communication open because it's important, again, particularly when things are tense. We interpret that, the way in back, that case, Jack, just a quick follow-up, if I may. How should we interpret, in that case, you know, the U.S. parking, uh, U.S. Navy parking warships uh, to the east of Taiwan? How should we interpret, you know, the Chinese warplanes flying over the line, div uh, divvying up the Taiwan Strait? Well, as a former naval officer, I can assure you we do not park warships anywhere, but we deploy them as appropriate. And um, uh, I'm not going to speak to individual unit movements right now. We have the 7th Fleet is present in the Western Pacific, uh, based in Japan. We have um, a lot of naval assets in, in the region, and they're, they're constantly moving around, and they're constantly conducting uh, operations and exercises to include what we call freedom of navigation exercises or operations. To what is happening there. I, I, I'm not going to talk about uh, force-level uh, movements uh, with respect to this. James, are you ready? Oh, that, oh my goodness. Okay. Thank and you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Admiral, uh, one on uh, Taiwan, if you would, and one on the Middle East very quickly. You keep telling us that U.S. policy hasn't changed and that the United States does not support an independent Taiwan. And yet, if we look at what Speaker Pelosi tweeted from the ground in Taiwan, her post actually states, quote, America stands with Taiwan. We all know that Taiwan harbors uh, ambitions toward independence. When the Speaker of the House says, we stand with Taiwan, America stands with Taiwan, how can the Chinese construe that as anything else but that you're supporting independence? I'll let the Speaker speak for herself. Um, all I can tell you, James, is what I told you yesterday, uh, and I'm happy to repeat it. Nothing has changed about our adherence to the One China policy. Nothing has changed about uh, our stance on Taiwan independence, which is that we do not support Taiwan independence. And nothing has changed, James, uh, about our commitments and how seriously we take those commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act. Everything is consistent, James. I, I, I can't say that any more clearly. So when she says America stands with Taiwan, is she misstating administration policy? You, you should talk to Speaker Pelosi about her comments. I'm not going to parse I'm not. I'm not saying that, James. I'm not going to speak for Speaker Pelosi. Uh, that's beyond my writ. I can speak for the administration when it comes to national security policy, and nothing has changed about our policy. On the Middle East, very quickly, um, is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps presently engaged in the conduct or support of terror activity? I think I know where this is getting. Uh, it's, you don't have to know. No, Just I think me. I know where you're getting with this. Uh, look. Uh, 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 I think the president's been uh, very, very clear. Is it uh, yes or no? Are they or are they not conducting or supporting terror activity? The Iranian state uh, is, a, is, is a state supporter of, of terrorism, and they support terrorist networks throughout the region. Um, and when asked if he would be willing to uh, lift the FTO designation of the IRGC as a function of, of the uh, negotiations with, uh, with Iran over the, the nuclear deal, the president said no. But are you, are you able to say that IRGC supports terror operations? I think I've answered James, the question. We're, we're moving on. We're going to do three, you, you, and then. Uh, which ones? OK. We're gonna do, you know who you're pointing at. I do not. I am so sorry. Uh, okay. Then we're going to go to Ed, and then we're going to end with Ed. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Brittany Griner's uh, trial in Russia resumed earlier today. 
uh, and a sentencing is expected potentially by the end of the week. Uh, in the, considering the fact that Russia made that counsel offer that the U.S. said was not a serious offer, how yes, confident is the U.S. that they will take such an offer for a prisoner swap? And if they do not, has the administration already talked about other plans of action to bring her home? Obviously, we're not going to negotiate this thing in, in public, uh, and I do appreciate the question, but um, uh, we, we, we've made a serious proposal, made a serious offer, and we urge the Russians to take that offer because it was done with sincerity, um, and, uh, and we know we can back it up. But I don't think it's helpful for Paul or for Brittany for us from the podium to get into a back and forth with the Russians over what the negotiations might or might not look like going forward. Um, uh, bottom line is we want to see Brittany and Paul come home to their families where they belong. Um, and the president takes that responsibility seriously and so seriously, in fact, that an offer has been made, a proposal has been put forth um, uh, to, uh, to affect that outcome. And uh, we urge the Russians to take it. Up. Uh, I spoke to Reverend uh, William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign, and he said something that Reverend Al Sharpton has said, that uh, a group of uh, diverse religious leaders would like to take a delegation trip to Russia if such negotiations do not work to bring Brittany home to make some type of moral, compassionate, humanitarian, uh, 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 compelling uh, argument to bring her home. Would the U.S. support a delegation trip if there was, if your negotiations were unsuccessful? Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to speculate on a hypothetical here. I, I would just tell you that we are working hard, government to government, to get Paul and, and Brittany home. Um, so much so that we did put forth a, a very serious proposal, and I, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Good answer. I want to ask you about the oil. Um, so I saw that the State Department approved a potential sale for Patriot missiles to Saudi Arabia. The trip last uh, month from the president between the king and the prince uh, happened. So tomorrow, OPEC decides to increase production or not. How confident are you that the Saudis will push OPEC to increase production? I won't get ahead of the Saudis or OPEC. I think you can understand I wouldn't uh, speak to that. Uh, we, uh, we had good discussions with them uh, on the president's trip uh, to include uh, productive discussions uh, on uh, on energy security, but look, this is a decision that uh, that OPEC has to make, uh, and I just wouldn't I wouldn't want to get ahead of that. But Regardless, the, but do you expect the Saudis to? I mean, you know, you, we're giving them weapons now. We have the meeting between the king and the president. Do you expect them to? Help yeah, us the out? question kind of presupposes there's some sort of a, a quid pro quo here, uh, and that's just not the case. Um, we provide defense articles like. Patriots uh, sell those to uh, Saudi Arabia because they have a legitimate need for air defense. In fact, one of the things they discussed on this trip was the potential or possibility for some sort of integrated air and missile defense throughout the region, and the Patriot batteries would contribute to that. Um, and yes, he met uh, with the king uh, and, uh, and the crown prince and his leadership team, as well as uh, all the leaders of the GCC plus three when he was out there, because there's a range of issues to talk about. Uh, energy security was on the agenda, but it wasn't the only agenda. I'm not going to speculate on about what OPEC might or might not do, but I do want to just come back to one point, and that is how seriously the president uh, takes uh, the issue of, of uh, supply in the energy market out there. And he has worked domestically to improve and increase that supply by releasing a million barrels a day all the way. This will go us all, take us all the way through October. That's nothing to sneeze at. That has actually helped stabilize the oil market. Um, and OPEC, as Karine has told you, uh, just this summer has increased by 50 percent their production for July and August already. And that has helped stabilize the market. And you're seeing the price now coming down, depending on which which variant you want to look at, it's either $93 uh, a, a barrel or it's 99 Either way, it's come down here in recent days. That's all good. That's all goodness for the market because more supply means more stability, and it helps depressurize the, the, the prices, which then will get hopefully translated uh, down to the pump. So the president's working hard here at home, uh, incre in, you know, increasing the numbers of permits that are out there. Um, and he's certainly working hard on the world stage uh, with world leaders to, to try to, again, help stabilize that market. Okay, we're going to take Tyler and then the foreign cooler. We should take him as well since you're here. But Tyler, um, back. John, just a quick question. Did the president uh, alert former President Obama or Bush or Trump 
took after the strike before he informed the public. President Obama did so when the U.S. killed Osama bin Laden. I'm wondering if there's any communication between the current president and his predecessors in that last I, You know, I, Tyler, I don't have, I, I, I I, uh, I'd have to go back and check. I don't know if there was uh, outreach to, to, to former commanders in chief uh, after the fact. There was no notifications to anybody b before the before the strike. Lila, you have the last. Yes, thank you. Uh, you believe that Afghanistan is now emerging as a safe haven for terrorists? No. <laughs> because we made it clear that uh, that we're not going to allow that to happen now. I want to also be clear, Balit, that that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be terrorists in Afghanistan. And we never said when we left that Afghanistan would never have a terrorist on their soil. What we said was the Taliban agreed to not allow Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists, uh, particularly terrorists that would attack the United States. That was part of the agreement. And what the president said was, he's not going to allow that, regardless of whether the Taliban meet their commitment. And he said that back then. Uh, we're not going to just take them at their word. We're going to watch ourselves. We're going to be vigilant. And we're not going to allow Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists that can attack the homeland. You shouldn't take away from the strike uh, that, that every single terrorist, uh, whether they're card carrying or not, um, is, uh, is going to uh, be the victim uh, of an airstrike by the United States or anybody else. But if we have credible evidence that a terrorist operating in Afghanistan or anywhere else, and as I said earlier, the threat has metastasized well beyond Afghanistan, the president will take action to defend this country and the American people. All right. uh, to what extent the Chinese actions last one week is impacting peace and stability in the neighborhood? I'm sorry, can you say that to what extent the Chinese actions is impacting the peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region? Well, it's certainly not helping. Uh, these actions that they've uh, taken in uh, in just the last uh, hours and days uh, certainly not helping to uh, to increase stability and security. Uh, and again, as I said in my opening statement, we're invested in that peace and security and that stability, um, and uh, we're not going to be saber out of and we're not going to do anything to increase the tensions. Uh, we'd like to see the tensions come down. We'd like to see the lines of communication with Beijing uh, stay open. Um, and uh, again, we uh, reiterate, there's no reason, just no justification whatsoever for uh, the tensions to amp up any more than they already are. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Thank really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the time, John. Appreciate it. Okay. Now for the boring part of the news. <laughs> okay, um, so today HHS released a new report uh, showing that the lowest number of Americans in history are uninsured. Uh, today, just 8%. Uh, this progress happened by, did not happen by accident. More than 35 million Americans are enrolled in Affordable Care Act-related coverage. Uh, the highest total on record, that includes 21 million people who are enrolled in ACA's expansion of Medicaid, and 5 million more people have gained health insurance coverage uh, since the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration, in large part because of the improvements uh, to the ACA in the American Rescue Plan. In order to keep this progress moving forward, Congress uh, should pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which will lock in an average of $800 per year savings in health insurance premiums for 13 million Americans and prevent 3 million Americans from becoming uninsured. Uh, today, President Biden, as you all saw uh, for yourselves earlier, uh, joined Governor Gretchen Whitmer, members of the Michigan congressional delegation, and business and labor leaders to mark the signing of the governor's executive direction to implement uh, the Chips and Science Act of 2022. This is just the first example of the federal-state partnership that will launch across the country as states leverage its once-in-a-century investment in their own states to bring in new projects and to create the project jobs and project jobs. 
We will have, I know folks are wondering and asking, but we will have an announcement on the official signing of CHIPS and Science Act soon, which will lower the cost, as you all know, you've all set, of heard, heard us say, everyday goods, creating high paying manufacturing jobs across the country, and strengthen our national security and U.S. leadership in the industries of the future. Lastly, a growing body, I'm sure you all saw, of economic experts have analyzed the Inflation Reduction Act and agree that it will lower cost, reduce inflation, and address a range of important and longstanding economic challenges. 126 leader, leading economists, including seven Nobel Prize winners, former Treasury secretaries, and a CBO director, and former CEA chairs wrote to Congress this morning endorsing the Inflation Reduction Act and calling for its passage. They wrote that these investments, and I quote, will fight inflation and lower costs for American families while setting the stage for strong and stable and broadly shared long-term economic growth, end quote. They note this package will, again, I quote, quickly and noticeably bring down health care costs uh, for families and would be more than fully paid for, end quote. They also underline that the revenue raised to finance these investments, investments would come exclusively from wealthy individuals and corporations. These are major priorities for the American people, including fair tax fairness, closing the tax loophole, as you heard us say, and where the President and Congressional Democrats have a, verifi a verified plan to fight inflation, Congressional Republicans, on the other hand, are standing against these investments because they are more about protecting tax welfare for those who gain the system than they do about curbing inflation. They are screaming bloody murder because this bill repeals, repeals sweetheart deals that led hedge fund managers pay for less income tax, income tax than the average American or stop multi-billion dollar corporations from exploiting loopholes to pay literally nothing or stops shielding wealthy tax sheets taking advantage of everyone in this room. As you all know, this year, congressional Republican like Rick Scott proposed Raise, uh, proposing raising taxes on about 100 million middle class Americans, 100 million middle class Americans. Americans have a clear choice between these agendas and the values behind them. Do we attack inflation with the Inflation Reduction Act, which we know works uh, or will work? Or do we extend the pain of inflation like congressional Rep Republicans are arguing for because they think it's more important to let the wealthiest Americans and big corporations take advantage than all of us and then to cut costs for the middle class. That's what we're left here. Those are the choices that we have to make. Okay, with that, Zeke. Thanks, Ben. I'm getting a good work from your, from your staff. You might have a, a bit of a hard out in 15, 20 minutes or so. Yep. But uh, there's two questions for on the on the drone strike in Afghanistan, following up on some of the John's answers earlier. Does the President believe that the, uh, the, the strike against al uh disrupted an active plot? against the United States? And also, is, uh, is the President, has he been briefed on any uh, threats to U.S. interests at home or abroad in potential retaliation for taking out al-Qaeda's top leader? Look, I th the way that I would just reiterate what John Kirby said up here, um, it was, it was um, the President has consistently said that he will now allow uh, Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists. He has said that a year ago, and he continues, and he, we met that commitment. Um, and what I will say is that uh, we showed uh, we showed that without American forces on the ground in Afghanistan and in harm's way, we remain able to identify and locate, locate even the world's most wanted terrorists and then take action to remove him from the battlefield. And that's what we did. That's what. Uh, uh, the President talked about yesterday, and that's the action that we took on, on Saturday. I'm not going to go into any intelligence uh, 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 previewing or hypotheticals or anything like that. All I can say is uh, we took action. This is an operation, a counter counterterrorism operation, a precision, uh, precise counterterrorism operation that we, that we took in Ka Kabul, Afghanistan, as you know, on Saturday. And this is something that the President has said we would be able to, to be, have the capabilities of doing that o over horizon 
bipartisan um, um, approach, and that's what the president was able to do. Uh, we have to remember who um, uh, who he was. He was uh, a mirror to the Al Qaeda. He was uh, uh, he was um, someone that we were not able to get. Uh, those 10 years that we did have uh, troops on the ground. And uh, when the president made that decision uh, to uh, to stop this, uh, to end a 20-year war that cost $2 trillion, that uh, that put American uh, women and, and, and men uh, in, our, in our military at, at, at risk, when he decided to do that, less than a year we were able to take, uh, we were able to get him. And so that's what matters. I, mean, I can't get into any specific intelligence from here. And then uh, the president obviously is still isolating uh, with COVID uh, in the residence. Uh, he was while this strike took place. And also when the strike, when he authorized the strike uh, last week, do you provide a little bit of color in terms of how he was briefed on it, you know, how the strike authorization was given? Is this all taking place over Zoom or video, secure video conference? You know, was he, could, could he be in a situation room? So as you know, the president could be president anywhere. And uh, as you know, he also, as you just mentioned, he's isolating in the White, uh, in the White House residence, as he, as he has been uh, since um, uh, he uh, tested most recently from a rebound uh, positive on Saturday, and so he's able to do to do these uh, to do these types of um, uh, conversation with his national security team clearly through uh, secured lines, uh, and that's what he was able to do. Uh, we have laid out the best that we can, right, to, to share with all of you uh, the steps that were taken uh, to make this decision. I believe it was uh, July 25th where he actually gave. Uh, the authorization to move forward. Uh, this has been weeks and months uh, in discussion uh, with his national security team, uh, leaders from his national security team to have this conversation. And as we all know, July on July 20th, uh, uh, 10 minutes or so before the 10 p.m. Hour, 10 p.m. hour, uh, the action uh, was taken that the president, the directive that the president gave. Uh, again, the president can work from anywhere, including the uh, the White House residence. That is always the case, uh, and he has been uh, doing the job for the American people, uh, eight plus 10 hours uh, a day, as he has said to me many times uh, during his, his uh, isolation. Uh, just quickly, uh, Green, um, the DOJ uh, filed a lawsuit against uh, Idaho for its near total abortion ban, um, saying that it violates uh, federal law. I mean, does the White House have a comment on that? And is the president aware? Uh, does he have any thoughts on, on this lawsuit? So um, just a couple of things that I do want to say on that, because I know that this ha just happened. So the, the administration, President Biden, remains committed to defending re reproductive rights. The Department of Justice, as you just stated today, sued the state of Idaho, whose abortion ban set to go into effect uh, later this month, imposes a near total ban uh, on abortion and criminalizes uh, doctors who provide abortions Idaho's law and its treatment of women is devastating, it's extreme, and threatens lives, period. Federal law makes clear doctors must provide women emergency medical care, including abortion services, to stabilize women facing health and life-threatening conditions. But under Idaho's near-total ban on abortion, women seeking emergency care for medical conditions like ectopic pregnancies or hemorrhages can be denied medically necessa necessary uh, health care by doctors. To put a finer point on it, pregnant women whose health and lives are in serious jeopardy may not receive the care they need under Idaho's abortion plan. President Biden has said many times that the only way to fully secure a woman's right to choose is for Congress to take action uh, to restore protections that Roe uh, was, had given women for almost 50 years uh, before the extreme decision was made at the Supreme Court uh, just a, a, over a month ago. Until then, the president is doing everything in his power to defend reproductive rights and protect the access to safe and legal abortion, and then we're going to continue to do that. Any thoughts on specifically the lawsuit today? Uh, I have not spoken to him about this this lawsuit uh, today this specifically. The this is the first that you're hearing from us on this today. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a question, uh, following up on Zeke's. Does the White? Uh, this has been one of the most successful weeks of, of the president's uh, tenure in the White House so far. 
I'm wondering if it's just a coincidence that it's happened while he has largely been isolating in the White House. Um, you know, the chip bill has passed, and historic agreement oh with Mr. Schumer. <laughs> what are you trying um, to say? Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering Whoa. if else finds it a uh, coincidence. Or, I mean, the president had a successful 2020 campaign where he was mostly working uh, from his home. Work from home has seemed to be successful for the president. Tyler, my goodness. Jeez. Yeah. Oh my gosh, uh, the cynicism. Um, look, the, the president is going to continue to work for the American people regardless. It, you know, it doesn't matter where he is. Um, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, uh, but you know, we've had successes over the last 18 months. It's not just been this week, right? No, no, no. <laughs> been a quite successful you, week for I, the president by, by all accounts. Yeah, but, but it's not the first time we had the American Rescue Plan. We had the bipartisan infrastructure deal. You know, we've had uh, other successes in this White House. Uh, and so, look, I, look, uh, you know, what we have seen the past couple of days, is the pres president grateful? Absolutely, for what we're seeing from uh, from Congress, the work that we have continued to do with them, the partnership that we have had with them for the past 18 months. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that's something that we have been working so hard for, that you're talking about during the campaign, that is like a down payment from what he was uh, uh, talking about from 2019, that we're now seeing uh, uh, moving forward, uh, and we uh, are grateful for that that, uh, you know, and uh, and so we're going to the CHIPS Act, as you just mentioned. He did an event with uh, the governor uh, of Michigan, um, and that's going to be uh, something that we'll see more on those type of uh, events with uh, state, state, um, state local officials. But look, you know, I, I will say this. This is all what we're seeing right now is because of the hard work of this administration, is because work that we have been doing uh, for some time now. Um, it just happens to be coming down at this time. Uh, but I wouldn't put it all together in one, uh, in one week or two. I'm just saying this is the work that we have been working towards. This is the hard work of this president. This is the hard work of this administration to continue to do the business of the American people. And he's still been working. I know, and I'm not he's still just been in working. Dark, it just at a time when, for the first time, when he has been forced by his medical diagnosis to stay in the residence, there's been a string of successes. I, I'm getting the sense that you're saying it's just a coincidence that the timing has aligned, but but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Tyler, wanna, my goodness. I just, yeah, I, I just think it's uh, an interesting phenomenon that we've seen uh, across a range of his priorities. They've all kind of come together. I, I think, think we should just be really thrilled and really excited that we're getting work done for the American people. And I think that's, uh, I think that's what matters at the end of the day. Yeah, Tim. Of quick infectious disease questions. First about uh, well, monkeypox and the president's COVID. First on the president's COVID, I think you may have answered this before, but I'm a little confused about when he would come out of isolation. Is it five days? Does he need to test negative twice? So he be we, stuck there I forever? believe we answered this uh, when we sent out a pool note on Saturday. I hope we, no one wants that to be stuck forever. I, we, some of us here have had COVID. You want to get out and you're right. When you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Um, I, I, we, we sent a pull note out. I, we're going to follow uh, CDC guidance on that. Uh, um, I believe it's five days of isolation uh, and, uh, and then clearly with a test, a, a negative test. Uh, we're going to continue to share uh, with all of you what his personal physician is sharing with us uh, on his condition. You guys got, uh, you got uh, an update on, on he's doing fine, he's doing well, uh, and he's, uh, he's ready to just continue to work, but work in person and not from the White House residence. So that's going to continue. And the, the other question is about um, monkeypox. The access to vaccines and treatments has been pretty uneven at this point, uh, with patients and their doctors kind of muddling through and trying to figure it out. Um, and, and we're wondering what the new monkeypox response coordinators will be able to do to improve this situation or what they're, what they're being tasked with. So, so they were both lead, Mr. Fenton and uh, Dr. Dasakalakis, uh, will lead the federal response to the monkeypox virus, as you just mentioned. They're going to be coordinating efforts uh, with HHS, DHS, and other federal agency and, uh, and teams. This is not the first time, clearly, that we have done this. We have, uh, you've, you guys got to know Dr. Ja uh, for a couple of days with me up here at the podium during, uh, uh, during the first, uh, during the president's first 
about uh, with COVID. And so we've done this before, uh, and so this is not new. Each federal agency will continue to play an important role in the response. Uh, the monkeypox response effort will be the best uh, able to coordinate uh, across the federal entities, listen to the needs of communities, and ensure timely uh, follow-up. Uh, and uh, Secretary Becerra, Dr. Walensky are playing their critical roles in the monkeypox response to date, ensuring that federal government can be responsive to testing, treatment, and vaccine needs of communities uh, and, nation and nationwide. Uh, one of the things that I did want, want to um, lay out about their uh, specific uh, expertise, operational expertise, that's really important as we think about uh, the coordinator and the, and, the, and the deputy coordinator, is that they have f over four decades of experience in emergency response and manageable national and global uh, public health issues such as uh, COVID-19 emergency response, HIV prevention, and other uh, disease control and urgent national crises. And, and as we talk about equity and being uh, and expanding equity, equitability, uh, this is something that uh, they are, have experience in uh, and they will be uh, working through as well. And look, you know, we have about 1.1 million vaccines that are available across the country. Uh, we are procuring another 5.5 million uh, doses. And so this is what we're ramping up, working on, having a comprehensive uh, response to monkeypox. Another thing that we need to do and that we're doing is making sure that uh, we have the testing out there. I talked about yesterday uh, how we have the capacity of 80, we've met the testing capacity of 80,000 uh, tests around uh, across the country and outreach. So those are the things that we will continue to do. We know, we always know there's more work uh, to be done. Uh, and so uh, one of the reasons that we had made sure that we announced the, the coordinator uh, from monkeypox. Yes. Thanks, Green. Um, on the Inflation Reduction Act, is, is the primary aim of this legislation to reduce inflation or to fight climate change and reform the prescription drug pricing system? I think all of it. I don't think it's, I, I think we, uh, you know, one of the things that the president has talked about, you've heard us talk about is one of his ec economic priority uh, is to lower costs, which is fight inflation. Uh, we see it in the name, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and we have heard, I just listed out 126 ec economists who agree with us, uh, that is going to uh, lower inflation and which is incredibly important. But we, we can't forget uh, the historic investment to climate change, right, to, to, to fight the climate crisis, which is something that the president has been doing from day one. He's taken bold actions. Uh, he wants to make sure that there that we lower those those energy costs for, for families, all connected. I think they're all connected. Uh, you think about the pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, this is also historic, as as many as as many uh, you know Democrats, including this president, has been fighting for a very long time to make sure that Medicare uh, can uh, indeed be able to uh, negotiate and lower costs for our seniors. Uh, so I I wouldn't pull anything out. I think this is together uh, uh, is going to lo lower cost for families. Uh, and uh, and if you think about the deficit, uh, bringing down the deficit, uh, adding another $300 billion to the $1.67 trillion that we saw last year, that's going to help uh, in, uh, as well uh, fight inflation and lower well, it, costs. It is called the Inflation Reduction Act. And, and it seems that the most favorable interpretation from economists, including those that the White House has cited is that this legislation will help bring down inflation in the long term, uh, perhaps later this decade. But there's near universal agreement that this is going to do very little to actually bring down inflation in the near term, which seems to be when Americans would be looking for an Inflation Reduction Act to actually address inflation. I, you know, I look. That is something that we, we disagree with, right? We think that um, this is going to have some effect for for American families when you think about negotiating. Uh, with Medicare, and so that it could lower cost uh, for your grandparents, for people who are senior in, in your household that you're trying to help, uh, and and make sure that they're they're able to get those that funding or those funds or pay for uh, those chronic medicine that matters. Uh, and so that is really important as well. Uh, there's going to be rebates for families uh, so that they're able, as it relates to energy uh, uh, costs, that's going to matter as well. Uh, those are those are huge. Those are incredibly uh, big for uh, for families just across the board, uh, especially in the middle class. And you know, you think about congressional Republicans and their plan. It's the complete opposite. Uh, they are not interested in lowering costs. If they were, this is it. This is the bill that exists in, in the House right now, in Congress, I should say, uh, in the Senate at the moment, uh, that could do that 
and they don't want to jump on board to, to help us lower cost for families. But do you have any evidence that this is going to lower inflation in the short term? Look, I just listed out 126 top economists who said that it's going to do that. Uh, I have a, They didn't a say in the short term, they just said generally. Well, I'm just saying that it is a step forward. Um, we do believe that if you lower cost for Americans, that matters. That is incredibly important because when you think about inflation, right, you think about how it's increasing prices, right? Crisis, people are paying more uh, for gas prices. And we saw the work that we have done in this administration uh, for the past almost seven weeks, right, we have seen gas prices go down, uh, saving families like 80 bucks a, a month if you have a two-car two household. That matters. If you think about uh, prescription drugs going down, bringing down the cost, that matters. That is connected uh, to what the, the pain, the inflation that pe of American families uh, uh, are talking about. Uh, and so, and when you talk about lowering the deficit, this is what this will do. That matters as well. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to, we, we believe it is, if you look at the name of the legislation, Infl uh, Inflation Reduction Act, it's going to do that. Uh, we have support of economists who say it's going to do that as well. Uh, and so we are grateful for this piece of legislation and, uh, you know, we, we hope it gets to the President's desk as soon as possible. I want to on Saudi Arabia, um, the, the State Department today approved the sale of these 300 Patriot missiles. It was announced the same day as the extension of this truce in Yemen. Were those two things connected? I, I don't have anything to share on that. I'm going to move on, though. Go ahead. We heard John Kirby say today that the threat from Al Qaeda is not over. But can you talk about how big of an operational impact on Al Qaeda this strike on the Zawahiri will have? I, I'm not going to go beyond to what John Kirby said today. Hey, Corinne. Yeah. So uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act, so the cor there's a corporate tax uh, increase to a minimum of 15 percent. How confident is the president that the companies will not pass that cost on to people in the form of higher prices? Uh, look, the reason why we uh, we talk about uh, we think the global minimum tax of 15 is or the minimum tax the corporate minimum tax of 15 is so important uh, is because you have 55 companies uh, corporate companies right now who pay absolutely nothing who pay zero dollars um, and. By doing this, we are fixing the tax loophole. It is important to do that. It is important to have a fairer tax system. Uh, and it is uh, important to just for people to pay their fair share. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars of profit uh, that we are seeing these companies bring in uh, and not paying a cent, not paying anything for it. Uh, I cannot speak to your question that you're asking me. I cannot speak to that. What I can speak is to this legislation and why it's so important uh, and why we need to get it done. Uh, and, um, and, and there should be, there should be bipartisan support for this legislation. There should be. Uh, when you think about Medicare, uh, when you think about energy costs, uh, when you keep think about the, uh, the deficit, lowering that deficit, continuing to, to do that, uh, and just making sure the tax code is fair. It's like people are paying their taxes. There's nothing here that we should be against. We should be supporting this legislation and delivering for middle class families. Okay. Thank you. Uh, later this month, India will be celebrating 75th Independence Day. Uh, it's the world's largest democracy. It has done a lot in the last 75 years. As the president of the world's oldest democracy, does the president have a message to the people of India or the Indian Americans as well? So we congratulate the people of India on 75 years of, of independence. Uh, India's nonviolent freedom struggle was an inspiration to the world, and we hope that the next 75 years see India continue to prosper. Uh, this year, the United States and India also celebrate 75 years of diplomatic relations, relations. As the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy, respectively, uh, we will continue to work together every day to deliver opportunity, security, freedom, and dignity to our peoples. Uh, we are partners in many important areas, including de defense, vaccines, climate, tech, and, and our ever-growing people-to-people uh, connections. Uh, the United States will continue to work with India to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific and address the challenges both our countries face uh, around the world. All right. Okay. Thank Anything? You. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you.